Hey, it's Mike here, and today, the creation of the Sahara Desert from what was previously a lush and green area of North Africa. And I've seen there's a ton of interest, several videos with millions of views created quite recently on YouTube, and none of them mention what could be a major human driver, or at least accelerating factor in creating this desert in the first place. This same human force is currently expanding the Sahara Desert southward, and is also a major driver of Amazon destruction. Destruction. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I'll tell you in 20 seconds, but you can take your bets now. Anyway, let's just go. Lightning fast, there are still spots on my Costa Rica trip, which is not a desert. It's also a nice lush jungle still. We're gonna eat a ton of delicious food, go on boats, explore a bunch of nature, see a bunch of cool animals and all that. So click a link below and you can reserve a spot, but moving on. So yes, 10,000 years ago, what is now the Sahara was lush and green, and it's crazy that we just had humans living there, and it's so obvious when we look in these desert caves, and we can see these murals of animals like giraffes and hippos. There's even a prophetic image of the pygmy hippo viral sensation Mu Dang. How did they know? I'm joking. Here's PBS explaining this. Hundreds, a German explorer crossing the Sahara encountered the paintings and engravings left behind by those early Holocene artists. And he puzzled over the mismatch between the scenes depicted in the rock art and the desert around it. Since then, modern geologists have been able to use many lines of evidence to confirm what the rock artists saw. Northern Africa was once much wetter, starting somewhere between 15,000 and 11,000 years ago and ending 5,000 years ago. And we can go to dried up rivers and lakes in the Sahara and find remains of fish and crocodiles and those hippos and other aquatic animals. Literally in the middle of the desert, this is an ancient mystery, but no, it's not aliens. They also had what was nearly an inland sea. It was a massive lake called Lake Mega Chad, <laughs> not Lake Giga Chad. I'm sorry. The whole thing was referred to as the African humid period. And the going explanation is that just due to the earth's wobble and changing moisture patterns and climate, uh, the whole thing just dried up. There was nothing else going on. This is called axial precession. And this is a cycle that lasts 26,000 years and it's the case where we have an interesting rain creation pattern. You would think, okay, this Northern hemisphere is actually getting more solar radiation. Shouldn't that have been drier? But no, that creates different air pressure phenomenon, which sucks up rain from the Atlantic and creates rainfall the African monsoons further north. But what surprised me is that according to models and estimates of this, it was only increasing rain by 17 to a maximum of 50% more than what it is today. So this isn't like the five or 10 times as much rain that you might expect a desert versus a non-desert to have. But okay, I accidentally drew this out further than I wanted to. Let's just get to the reason a relatively recent paper, a study in the frontiers in earth sciences claims, hey, that tilt doesn't explain the whole picture. Actually, livestock grazing appears to be a major driver of either accelerating or fully creating the Sahara at times. The study itself says that particular grazing habits were the decisive factor in irreversibly reducing the net primary productivity of ecosystems that existed in a threshold state. I think we can make that a little bit more digestible as the Smithsonian explained the study. Quote, wherever the archeological records show the presence of pastoralists, humans with their domesticated animals, there was a corresponding change in the types and variety of plants. It was as if every time humans and their goats and cattle hopscotched across the grasslands, they had turned everything to scrub and desert in their wake. Okay, but how would just letting animals eat some grass and stuff end up changing the weather patterns? Well, directly from the author of the study himself, quote, by overgrazing the grasses, they were reducing the amount of atmospheric moisture. Plants give off moisture, which produces clouds and enhancing albedo. And albedo is the amount of sunlight that hits the ground, which can affect, of course, the temperature and the moisture. And as a result, change the weather. There was more going on than this alone, which the study says was not just enhanced albedo, but also dust entrainment and retardation Hearted inland monsoon convection, yes, talking about the monsoon from the ocean, pushing pastoralists into new territories to begin the cycle again. So we can imagine North Africa being lush and essentially being eaten away. These pastoralists would seek the nice grass and shrubs and stuff feed their animals like goats and cattle on that till it desertified essentially and keep on moving, desertify again, keep on moving until oops, you've got the Sahara Desert, the largest non-frozen desert in the world. And it's fair to say, hey, how do we know that this isn't 
correlation and that it's not causation and we don't have a time machine so we'll probably never know but you might say hey maybe it was already drying up and these people were just following that line of moisture well they make an argument against that from several angles you know as their charts show looking to this chart well we have a nice gradual change in that wobble and the solar radiation we see things like a dramatic change right as livestock shows up looking to lake mega chad well the level plummets when animals are introduced super sketchy a <laughs> little bit of a coincidence there it probably should have dropped a little bit before that if animals had nothing to do with it also cores off the ocean that hold sediment and even pollen can tell us a story especially for western africa that is now the sahara and the result is that we see a collapse in pollen levels right as animals were introduced to that western sahara area and when you're asking the question could animals have caused this we can also just look to current and recent ways and times that animals have directly caused desertification. Sorry for using a ton of quotes here, I just think it's more credible. But from this paper, as a result of grazing, quote, some pastoral cultures like the Herero of Namibia and the Samburu of Northern Kenya have degraded their environments to the point where temporary abandonment was required. And perhaps the strongest argument for all of this is that, again, we are currently expanding the Sahara further south in the Sahel, that belt just south of the Sahara. And in this case, we have papers like this pointing to the same reasons, like how grazing is leading to less ground cover, lower biomass, less water holding capacity of the Sahoyl, <laughs> of the Sahoyl in the Sahel. I really don't want to see the SA taken out of this and have it just turn into hell. But uh, as the paper mentions, these livestock grazing and other practices have resulted in 650,000 square kilometers just being lost to desert in the last five decades. So yeah, it's not looking good. And again, these are the same exact things that the main paper cites as reasons the Sahara was created or accelerated, getting rid of the vegetation through grazing, and that is making it worse for moisture holding patterns and weather patterns, etc. But I do wanna rewind back to the potential drivers they talk about in the study and one of them has to do with burning, whether it was just natural burning or man-made burning, because they say humans could have grazed after fires when wild animals would have just let things regrow. It's a bit speculative, but the idea is that we have that flush of grasses, etc., after fire, and they might just graze their animals in, eat that, lead to desertification, when wild animals would stay away from that and probably be afraid to be exposed to predators. And if I were to expand on this, I would just look no further than what's happening in the Amazon rainforest, where they are literally burning it down for cattle ranching. You know, it's a situation where fire can quickly clear some land for grassland, and it's very possible that humans knew this. I mean, it was really not that long ago. Humans were just as smart. We've been just as smart for 300,000 years, and this was just 10,000 years ago. So what we're seeing happen in the Amazon might be a modern mirror of what occurred in the Sahara, although I would love to see more data. They have some charcoal and stuff, but we need more <laughs> to claim that. However, very huge point, the main driver of Amazon destruction is cattle ranching, whether they're burning it or chopping it directly. That's a known fact from this paper. And I really don't wanna see the Amazon rainforest become the Amazon desert. And as the World Wildlife Foundation echoes a report, 30 to 60% of the Amazon could become dry savanna, which is just one step closer to desert. And this is why I think people should learn about this and know about this as a warning, because we could literally repeat history here by clearing out all this vegetation in the Amazon, which is the lungs of the earth. We really need it to help fight climate change right now. And instead we could just destroy it because we want to have meat. And then a final point here is that I can't help but think of what Africa would look like if it had at least less of the Sahara. Who knows where we would have landed if grazing wasn't a factor, what the natural cycle would have really been. But let's just say we had 50% of the Sahara that we currently have today. That would mean a ton more resources, probably a much larger Lake Chad and a lot more water resources in an area that has a lot of resource-based conflict. So in the end, when I did do a short on this topic a while back, I haven't seen anybody else talk about this. I don't know if there just weren't that many eyes on it or if people just don't care, but I would go ahead and say that this is like one of the largest impacts that humans possibly had on the planet in the last 10,000 years, you know, in terms of creating the largest desert on the earth that again, isn't frozen in an area that 
could have supported a lot of people, could have supported a lot of wildlife, could have helped us sequester more carbon, etc. And thankfully, we are doing those little Earth smiles and starting to get some of the Sahara back in certain little chunks. But we have to be concerned about what we're doing with livestock and grazing because clearly there's a better way. And I know some people might watch this and be like, oh, well, Alan Savory, regenerative grazing, blah, blah, blah. All of that in my book has fallen short. I have an entire video on that. A lot of times there are these sort of hidden inputs when you're looking closer, now, whether they're essentially irrigating the site by feeding the cattle water. I mean, I mean we know that irrigation versus non-irrigation looks like this. So the amazing pictures you might see in a TED talk might not reflect reality. You know, and studies are failing to reproduce the claims, etc. But now you know about this study. And of course, again, down below, there's a link to that Costa Rica chip. If you want to hop on, I really want to make this second one happen. I already have one that's full right before it, but this one's on February 4th. So if that works for you, click the link below. You know, let me know down below if there are any other points I potentially missed, any other drivers of desertification or how it could have been livestock or how, yeah, it was livestock. And of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.